there we go. Okay, good. Right, continue. Um, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to um, welcome to this uh, this webinar, Soil, the Heart and Soul of Organic Growing. Um, I'm Phil Sumption from the Organic Growers Alliance, and uh, just to firstly explain a bit about the the webinar program. This is a the seventh in a series of um, webinars that we've um, we've been running, um, and it's um, a, it's um, the commu the Community Supported Agriculture Network UK, Landworkers Alliance, uh, the Organic Growers Alliance, and the Seed Sovereignty Program working together to run monthly webinars, um, which are generally the last Wednesday of every month, and they've been throughout throughout uh, 2021, um, and they focused on practical teaching and farm to farmer knowledge exchange um, and from farmers and growers around the UK. And the series is designed to increase knowledge exchange and learning on both the politics and practice of agroecology and food sovereignty. And it's we're very grateful to Farming the Future, for Farming the Future, who, who have supported the programme, um, which has basically came back as a response to COVID. Um, and if you're interested in, um, uh, in, or in running a webinar or have a theme, or practice you'd like to know about, or a specific topic that you'd like to present, then please get in, in touch in touch with us. Um, and you know, if it's in in the course of the evening, you can um, you can put, put put it in the put it in the chat, or you can send send an uh, an email to uh, to me or to hello at Organic Growers Alliance if you've got any if you've got any ideas. Um, yeah, it's great. Thank you all for coming. It's it's um, great. To have um, a reasonable turnout on a sort of uh, when at a time when probably people are maybe a little bit got a little bit fed up with webinars after um, um, uh, after a year year eighteen months of uh, of sort of COVID induced lockdown etc and uh, sort of back to yearning for for um, face to face events but um, as I was saying earlier it's great that we can have uh, that we can involve people from um, that we wouldn't normally be able to get together. So this is um, fantastic that we've got Dave Chapman here from, um, from Vermont, from the um, Real Organic Project. And we've also got Jonathan, um, Jonathan Smith from, from the Isles of Scilly, who um, again, wouldn't be someone who would, who would uh, it's not that easy for him necessarily to, to hop over um, to, to the mainland for, for, for events. So, um, we can travel virtually between um, between those uh, these locations tonight, which is brilliant. Um, okay, so the the event soil heart and soul of organic growing. I mean, it's really the come about because um, rec recognition of the fact that that soil is absolutely vital for the integrity of of, of organic production. And, and that's something that um, us organic growers we were very, very, very clear about here. But there are various threats to that um, uh, occurring, which we'll hear, which we'll hear about. Um, and the and the aim of this, this this session is to explore why this all is so important, and what those threats are, and how as growers we can maximise the vitality of our of our soils for healthy crops, people, and planet. And also how we can communicate better what we what we do and why soil is a, is so important to to um, people who might um, might buy our produce. Uh, so yeah, a little bit of um, housekeeping um, for, first off. Um, Janae, do you want to say about the chat and the Q and A a little bit? Sure, just very quickly. Um, if you want to make a comment to all of the attendees, please make sure that you've selected panelists and attendees. If you have a question for the panelists, please stick it in the Q&A, which you'll see kind of hovering around uh, whoever's speaking on the bottom, um, and we'll be able to answer them all um, at the at the end. Someone has requested that we turn the sound up. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's each individual computer. So maybe if all the speakers just make sure that if they've got a mic, they're speaking quite close to it. And um, uh, Huxley, please do let us know if you're still having trouble. Or if other people are troubling trouble with the hearing, and so yeah, we'll answer the questions at the end. Okay, good. Um, yeah, we're going to um, kick off with um, um, with with, with Dave, Dave Chapman, who um, runs uh, Longwind Farm in Vermont in the USA, 
Um, he is also the ex executive director of the Real Organic Project and a founding member of Vermont Organic Farmers. Um, he's been very active and in the movement to keep the soil in organic. And um, we've been, as OGA, we've been in contact with Dave for, for a number of years and, uh, and who has written articles for us in the, in the Organic Grower and, speak, and spoke um, at a session that we ran at the Organic Producers Conference uh, a few years ago through a video. Um, and he's also um, proud to be a current member of the policy committee of the Organic Farmers Association and he served on the USDA Hydroponic Task Force. So um, I think I'll, let, I'll, I'll hand it over now to, to you, Dave, to, um, um, to, to kick us off on the Real Organic Project. Thank you, Phil. <clears throat> okay. Um... I'm not going to talk too much about my my own farm today because I don't think that's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. I can say that I have about two and a half acres of greenhouse and we grow tomatoes in it uh, in the soil, which in America now I have to say that as an organic grower, I grow in the soil. Uh, seems crazy. Um, and just to say, I, I learned how to grow in the soil in a greenhouse actually from England. Um, Doug Weil was somebody who wrote a pamphlet a long time ago uh, about greenhouse growing in, in the Europe and uh, organic greenhouse growing. And I got that booklet from my friend Elliot Coleman and it was very inspiring to me. So that became the, the beginning of how I learned to, I was already growing organically in the field, but, but that became the beginning of growing organically in a greenhouse. Um, I have a few pictures, but I, I'm just going to talk for a minute first. Um, it was about seven years ago that uh, I started to discover there were profound problems with the National Organic Program in terms of their integrity, in terms of their transparency. I've been growing, I, I've been growing for about 40 years now. And in Vermont, the state I live, there is tremendous integrity. There are there are no confinement livestock operations being certified. There are no hydroponic operations being certified. But in the marketplace, I started to see all these beautiful, inexpensive certified organic tomatoes from Mexico showing up. And I was like, boy, these are cheap and there's a lot of them. And I did a little research and I discovered that they were being grown hydroponically. Uh, if anybody doesn't understand that, it means that they're grown without soil that, that all the nutrition is supplied as a liquid feed of plant available nutrients. And, um, you know, we had talked about it in America and, and it had been a question for our National Organic Standards Board and the Standards Board had decided in 2010 that hydroponics should not be, could not be certified as organic. And we thought, good, problem resolved. And this was four years later and the problem obviously wasn't resolved. We started out um, thinking maybe the National Organic Program was just, you know, oopsie daisy, they made a mistake. They didn't notice this was happening, that they weren't paying attention. And a friend and I started a petition. We didn't know what else to do. And uh, we got about 1500 people to sign the petition. But some of those people were extremely prominent in the organic movement in America um, and, and in the food movement. I mean, we, we got uh, Elliot Coleman and, and, and Fred Kirshenman and Michael Pollan and Dan Barber. And, and these are names that were well known to uh, American culture. And so the petition had to be taken somewhat seriously and it began a discussion. And what we discovered was that this was not a mistake in terms of they didn't notice what was happening. What we discovered was that the USDA had been lobbied at the highest levels for some years before that to quietly allow the certification of hydroponic production. And um, it took a while for me to realize that even in this, we thought we were having a debate. And as, as Bill McKibben said of climate, the climate battle, he said, we thought we were in a debate. And then I realized we had won the debate years before and we were in a fight. 
and it was a fight with money and power as such fights always are. So uh, we are in a fight and, and actually we all are around the world, even though uh, the EU and England have uh, much cleaner, stronger standards and enforcement in this area. But I think that, you know, it's a world food system now and it's a world organic food system. And uh, for good and for ill, the US is the biggest market of that. And what happens in America is going to affect the whole world. And it's gonna be harder and harder for the rest of the world to keep on with standards that are meaningful, that, that understand that organic must be based on, on the, the health and the fertility of the soil. Hydroponics is the uh, diametric opposite of organic farming. Organic farming was originally not focused on pesticides, it was focused on soil health and that that provided plant health and that provided animal health and human health. And um, these are the fan foundational principles of, uh, of organic farming that you must feed the soil in order to feed the plant. So feed the soil, not the plant. Hydroponic is the opposite philosophy. You feed the plant, you don't even need soil. <laughs> Get rid of it, it works better without it. I've talked to many hydroponic people who believe what they're doing is better than soil growing. And that, that's fine, they're welcome to that belief and they're welcome to market it. Uh, but instead what's happened is that we've got major hydroponic producers selling their stuff as organic, certified organic in the US. And they will even publicly deny that what they're doing is hydroponic. Uh, so, you know, to me that, that has now moved into the realm of fraud. Um, but the question is, is it possible to stop such powerful players? As I got into this debate, I, I, this fight, I realized that we were also fighting confinement livestock in organic. I had no idea that that was going on. But in America, uh, I would say the majority of milk is coming certified as organic, is coming from confinement dairies. And for sure, three quarters at least of the organic eggs on the shelves are coming from confinement poultry CAFO operations. A CAFO, a C-A-F-O, is a concentrated animal feeding operation. It's a USDA term. So that's become the norm by far. I mean, it's 99% of the meat, milk, and eggs in America. Um, <laughs> and uh, sorry, I'm hearing people in the background saying <laughs> that they love each other. <laughs> it's wonderful. Okay, I'm sorry. So uh, I realized that, that the USDA at this point you know, there was a real battle between the organic movement and organic, national organic program. And the program was being really guided very much by the organic industry. So we, we, we had a problem. I, uh, because this became a, a big deal and there were rallies and, and protests um, of, uh, led by farmers, um, this became, a showdown really, and we lost that showdown. That's the important thing. We didn't lose it in one sense because we did create an active movement again. The organic movement had become, I think a little overwhelmed by the money pouring in and you know, farmers are just desperately trying to make a living. The, the CAFO operations have put out of business many organic dairy farmers. Um, so there are real economic consequences as real as well as the real consequences of loss of integrity of the label. But there's a movement that has integrity, uh, but those people are getting pushed out. In the case of uh, poultry, that's happened actually a while ago already now. Uh, there are lawsuits about this so far. We haven't been winning the lawsuits. The one time that we did win a lawsuit was years ago, a guy sued for, um, the USDA allowing um, prohibited synthetics into processing. He won the lawsuit. It was just one farmer. He, he defended himself in court and won. And uh, I think two, three months later, maybe Congress changed the law in a very 
back backroom deal kind of a way. So it showed that even to go to the courts is going to be very hard to win this. It's going to take uh, public awareness. And that's why uh, after we lost a kind of a final attempt at reform, we started the Real Organic Project. And um, it's an attempt to create an add-on label. And people say, oh, is that organic 2.0? And I say, no, it's organic 1.0. It's just organic. But the National Organic Program is organic 0.25 now. And, you know, there are thousands and thousands of real organic farmers who are certified in the USDA. The majority of the farms are, are completely legitimate and doing a good job, but um, not necessarily the majority of what's being sown, being sold in the different crops. So I said three quarters of the eggs, half the milk, uh, somewhere between one third and two thirds of the tomatoes are hydroponic. Some of them come from Holland. They could not be sold as organic in Holland but they're certified by the USDA and shipped here. They're hydroponic. Same is true in Mexico. They could not be sold as organic in Mexico, but they're certified by the USDA and shipped here. So we see that we are in a fight. You know, I, I'm not, I, I don't particularly enjoy fights. Um, I would rather be friends and get along, but at some point, you know, we have to say enough enough. We, it, if we believe in this, and I, I'm sure everyone who's here um, does, then uh, we're not going to win this without a fight. Uh, otherwise, organic as we know it will be forgotten by a later generation. There will be a movement. It'll, they'll come up with another name, and maybe it'll be agroecological or regenerative, but I, I don't know what it's like in England, but in America, regenerative has already been lost to the same corporation. Now Cargill and uh, Bear Monsanto and General Mills and McDonald's all claim to be regenerative companies. They're all claiming that mantle and the poor regenerative farmers, the real ones, I said, you're gonna have to have a real regenerative movement too. So uh, that's the situation we're in. Okay, I'm gonna run through a few slides just to show you uh, what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a share screen here for a minute. Uh, click to this. Okay. Um, so these pictures weren't actually made for this talk, but uh, it'll, it'll give us an idea. Um, I'm gonna... I, I told you all that. <laughs> so we're talking about soil in both cases, whether you're talking about, about um, CAFO confinement livestock or whether you're talking about vegetables, fruits, and berries. Um, so this is a certified organic hydroponic operation in Mexico. Um, this, is, this company has, I think, about 68 acres of glass greenhouse. Uh, they're very good at what they do. I, I know them. I, I know one of their head growers. Um, and it's certified as organic. And this is certified as organic. This is my farm. This is also certified with the Real Organic Project. And this is the difference that we're talking about. This is a 20-acre hydroponic blueberry operation in Florida, 20 acres of black plastic. 20 acres of pots with drip feed. Uh, soil is completely divorced from the entire operation, certified as organic. This is the kind of farm they're putting out of business. This is a 20 acre blueberry operation also in Florida, certified with a real organic project. And it's fantastic. They do a beautiful job. They have tremendously delicious fruit. But the owner of this farm said to me, you know, when you permit hydroponic to be certified as organic, you're not building a bigger tent. You're not allowing diversity. You're actually mandating it because we have to compete with them for markets. And the markets, the, I don't mean the consumer. I don't mean the eater. I mean, the, the buyer for the chain is going to buy the cheaper one. That's just how it is. I've 
had this conversation with buyers of major chains and they say, Dave, please, if it's certified you by the USDA as organic, it's good enough for me. And it is good enough for them. And so we're gonna to have to fight to have a label that means what we say. It's not gonna be enough to try and just persuade people that this brand or that brand is better. This is um, a poultry operation certified as organic. This was part of a series, there was a series of articles in the Washington Post, which is a very big newspaper in America. And they did one just on poultry, they did one just on dairy, and they did one on grain fraud, uh, mostly imported from, from uh, Eastern Europe. And so this is certified as organic. Obviously, these chickens never go outside. This is a certified real organic operation. This is viable. It works. We know that. We all know that. And um, the question is, you know, will we survive? Will people who want to buy from this end up buying from this? Because I promise you the picture on the egg carton doesn't look like this, right? This is an another uh, place from, I think this is Aurora Dairy. And um, this is a confinement operation. Uh, I interviewed the guy who wrote the stories. He said, you know, they did flyovers, they tested the milk, um, they visited, they visited the farm a number of times, and they never saw more than a couple hundred cows out on pasture. And the other 14,800 were in confinement. This is sold as organic. This is what a real organic farm looks like. We know that, right? These are happy, healthy cattle there. I happen to eat yogurt every day from this dairy and it's fantastic, certified real organic. This is a Congresswoman in America, Shelley Pingree. I'm gonna read this quotation. I know that you're not supposed to do that, but in case you don't know, there are 12,000 lobbyists on the Hill, that's Capitol Hill, that work for the agriculture and food processing, processing industry. And they spend about $350 million a year on forming opinions in Washington. And that's more than the defense industry. So don't underestimate their power. Shelley is one of the few organic farmers who serves in Congress. This is Elliot. Um, I'm, it's wonderful to read his stuff, but I'm gonna skip this for now. Francis Tickey, who served on the National Organic Standards Board, and um, he's just saying that if the rules were enforced and, and you had to buy, uh, you had to be, in order to get certified, your, your cattle actually had to go out on pasture every day, then the real farmers would thrive. Obviously, the CAFOs would be gone. So Houston, we have a problem. That's an American expression. And we have a solution too. And that is the Real Organic Project. So I told you about the ra many rallies we had. This was one of them. And um, I can say I was there. It was a lot of fun. Uh, this is another one down in Jacksonville, Florida. That's my co-director, Lindley Dixon, um, holding the Protect Organic sign. This is Senator Patrick Leahy from Vermont, who is uh, basically the father of the National Organic Program. He was the sponsor of the original law, and he spoke at this rally, and he said, I want organic to mean organic to mean organic. We do have supporters, but we don't have enough. So uh, this is not going to be simple. This is the symposium that we had. Many people spoke at it. One was Al Gore, our former vice president and Nobel laureate, and Al Gore's farm is certified real organic with us. Um, yeah, I, I, I threw in pictures of people just for fun. This, this is Leah Penniman, who was one of the speakers at our symposium. She's great. She's the author of Farming While Black. Um, this is a wonderful um, farm out in, in the West. And they grow about 450 head of beef and um, proud to be certified with a real organic project. Bandana Shiva holding up a Keep the Soil in Organic. Real Organic is Not Hydroponic t-shirt. Um, this is one of our fellow board members. You can see the logos showing up. 
um, another one of our board members, also a former National Organic Standards Board member. So we have a lot of people who uh, get it and more every day. Um, we're, we're expecting to hit a thousand farms certified this year. We're only, this is only our, our, our third year. So we're, we're ramping up fairly quickly. I like this picture of Nora because she's from Nacherland in Germany. And um, we've done a great deal of work with Nacherland on learning what's happening in the rest of the world. This has got to be a world movement. It's, it's not enough for it to be okay in Vermont. It really isn't. And one of the things that we've seen in Vermont is that most of Vermont farmers are doing great, but not the dairy farms because they sell into a, a much bigger food system as wholesalers and they're going out of business. So these are all the farms that are certified or getting certified this year all over our country. And um, this was just, you know, one of our rallies. So. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing if I can figure out how. And I think I'm out of time too. So um, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. That was, um, that, that, that was, really, that was really good. And um, there's no way I would could, could stop you in full, in full flow. But uh, um, so, yeah, um, I think, yeah, that it's, it's very much... You know, it, it, it's very, you know, we have to be aware of what's going on on the other side of the Atlantic. And uh, um, and there are some issues that are very, are very similar here in terms of the, the way that um, organic can be, um, that the concept of organic can be diluted or can be taken over by corporate interest to an extent. And, and it's really how, to, how we can bring it back to what are the core, the core values of, of the, what the pioneers of organic farming um, and it, what they thought, and 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 whenever we get we we get a lot of um, there's there's a lot of talk about regenerative agriculture. There's a lot of talk about agroecology, and all of those principles, in my opinion, are part or should be part of organic farming, and uh, and that's what we have to get to get over to people. I think to an extent. Um, so thank you for that. And if there's any questions for David, put them in the quick Q and A, and we'll come back to them at the end after we've. Um, um, handed over to, to, to Jonathan. So, um, yeah, um, introduce um, introduce jo Jonathan Smith. Um, I always think of, think think of you as being a, a, a being a young grower, but you've been around quite a while now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, you're still young. You're still young to me. But, um, Jonathan um, farms on the on the on the Chile, um, and uh, very very beautiful um, idyllic location. But uh, um, Jonathan also has a passion, a passion for soils, um, and uh, uh, and is involved in the um, the director of the Farm Carbon Toolkit, which you'll talk about. about and he's co-developed the Farm Carbon cal Calculator, supporting growers assessing their carbon emissions and sequestration on on the land that they that they steward. And um, Jonathan's going to talk a little bit about about his 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 farming system and how some of those tools can also help us um, farm better and, and for, for better soil health and, and um, sequestration of carbon. So thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. I'll hand, o hand over to you um, if you want to share your screen. Yeah. OK, thank you, Phil. And thank you, Dave. Really interesting um, to get a perspective from over the pond there. Um, yeah, so as Phil says, I'm going to talk a little bit about my farm and then um, some wider principles as well. So we're going to start off with uh, uh, where I am. So, yeah, as Phil says, a very beautiful location. This is St Martin's on the Isles of Scilly, which is off the far southwest of the UK, about 30 miles off the mainland of Cornwall. Um, there's a little drone shot that was taken uh, <clears throat> on a recent film I had done. So literally my farm is some of these fields right behind the beach here that you can see. Uh, and there's a reason I put this up, actually, not just to uh, make everyone totally envious that, uh, mm -hmm. of this pretty incredible location, which it is, and, it, you know, it's really stunning. Uh, but you also have to appreciate that, so we're still sort of, this beach is facing south, so prevailing winds southwest from sort of over here. So you can imagine the storm, <clears throat> basically you get a conveyor belt of sand going from the beach straight over into my fields. 
So you might say, um, what a ridiculous location to uh, to try farming. Um, well, I'll tell you, the office view is pretty good, but uh, it does re represent a few challenges in terms of soil. Um, so, yeah, I put a question mark of soil. A lot of people who come around to my farm say, you, you, you're growing in that? What? What are you doing? Um, to say it's sandy is an understatement. It is sort of, um, in places, dirty sand, um, which is certainly pretty challenging. But what it does do is really force you to focus quite heavily on soil organic matter and actually what the uh, how the soil is made up and how you kind of build fertility so when i took these fields on uh, these were completely overgrown just go back one side again so if you look at the hillside kind of behind my fields they, they kind of look something like that overgrown with bracken and gorse and brambles so that was about 20 years ago um, and i gradually cleared them and, and built up fertility and uh, a lot of it is actually using seaweed from the beach storm wash seaweed onto the beach in the winter and, and apply that to the field. Um, <clears throat> so actually farmers around the coast, certainly of um, the UK, Ireland, Northern France and Spain have used seaweed for, uh, for generations. Uh, and given we are yeah, literally a stone's throw from the beach, actually it's, it's really good fertilizer. Um, and often you find that coastal soils are very sandy for the very nature of where they are. Uh, but actually the combination of sand and seaweed is really good. And just to explain, so I get this asked, asked this quite a lot. So effectively here we are, this is sort of November or December. I'll take this uh, up into the field, about a 10 minute drive, if that, five minute drive, um, tip it out, spread it out. It'd be about six inches thick when you're spreading it out, but bearing in mind that's a lot of uh, air and water. After about two to three months, that will drop down to about um, an inch or two thick, and then that can be cultivated. Um, so there's a lot of organic matter going on there. It's all free. And, uh, and another question I get asked, is it very salty? Well, it is, but because we've got, um, you put it on in the winter, obviously you've got a lot of rain, it washes the salt through the profile and we don't really see a buildup of, of salt, although I imagine you might if it was a very shallow soil, but ours aren't, they're just feet and feet of sand. So, um, that's kind of main fertility, uh, one of the main fertility sources. <clears throat> and here we are, it works. And I always think um, uh, we've got perfect land for growing carrots, absolutely. So once you get them established, they grow nice long roots and uh, they haven't really got a problem with fertility. And we've got some, uh, some fantastic carrots and taste really, really sweet. People seem to love them. But I always think quite a good determinant of um, how good your growing system is. For me, an indicator in summer is something like um, salad. And we do loads of mixed salad leaves, see our mix here on the right. Uh, and they sell really well, so loads of that in the summer. Uh, and generally, we are getting good crops of salad, and they're not irrigated. They get a couple of uh, waterings when they're planted, and then they have to fend for themselves. Uh, this summer, it's kind of okay. It gets a bit squeaky if it's uh, you get a dry spell for about five weeks. Um, but yeah, to me, that's a good indicator that we have got organic matter building and, and decent soil fertility. Likewise, in the winter, I always argue that brassicas are a good indicator and we get some really nice uh, yeah, collies, which obviously are, are a coastal plant, but they need a decent amount of organic matter. We use uh, get a lot of purple sprouting broccoli. Um, and that also grows well. Potatoes are really good in this soil, um, get some really nice early spuds. Uh, and again, you know, quite a nice skin finish with um, with a nice sandy soil as well. So really just putting this up. To make the point that um, I'm, I'm not suggesting that all my fields are perfect by any means and, and they'll have the most stunning produce that you'll find in the land but the point that actually you can build up decent soils even in in places where ordinarily you would look at it and say actually that's pretty challenging why would you farm there the reason I took the fields on is because there wasn't anything else available uh, we have a very finite amount of land it's all rented from the Duchy of Cornwall so Prince Charles is ultimately, ultimately my landlord um, and, you know, I've made it work, essentially. But it's taken a bit of time and a bit of refinement. And so in terms of the kind of processes that I've used to build up soil, um, adding a lot of organic matter. So as I said, we've already got the, uh, the seaweed going in here, uh, which goes on in the winter, roughly between sort of November and, and January. Uh, you make our own compost, which we're adding to some of the higher value crops and into the polytunnels. Uh, and actually making some quite decent compost, a mixture of kind of crop waste, grass cuttings, a bit of seaweed thrown in there, um, even some bracken, which grows extremely well um, on the island. 
Um, and then we've also got green manures as part of the rotation, probably about a quarter of the rotation. Uh, down the bottom right there, you'll see uh, that's actually some roots of some sweet clover, which grows really well on our soils, big tap root um, and uh, lots of nodules and, and fixing a lot of nitrogen. Tend to leave that in for about two years, actually. Always find it's better in the second year than the first. So there's plenty of inputs of organic matter going on. Um, even though it's sandy soil, it does burn up quite quick. Um, so it's a definite disadvantage. You really have to um, yeah, keep adding that organic matter to, to keep the organic matter levels going up. Hope that that's the aim. I want to just sort of touch really also on the other side of the equation, not just about what we're adding, but how we're avoiding taking it away. As I mentioned, we've got green manures as part of the rotation. Uh, on the far left of the tractor there, you'll see a little patch of um, sweet clover there. We've got a couple of other much bigger fields of that as well. Uh, this was actually taken in May this year. So actually this patch here had seaweed, it was cultivated because it's quite difficult to um, incorporate that amount of uh, organic matter without cultivating. But I'm very conscious that actually cultivating is one of the worst things we can do, especially on soils like this. And um, so actually, if you look at the area of black plastic there behind the tractor, that is now planted as squash and courgettes, and they're doing really, really well. There's actually the same happening at the back of the field, though you can't see that. Um, and that plastic will leave down now until about March next year. So once all the squash are harvested, we'll just leave that plastic down over the winter uh, and it will create a really nice um, fertile soil underneath. And next year, we'll just simply take that plastic up, not even cultivate and, and drill carrots in there. And that to me is working really, really well because it's killing off all the weeds underneath. We're not having to cultivate again. So it's reducing the cultivations. Carrots don't need vast amounts of fertility. Uh, and we get some really nice clean carrots um, in that soil. So that's an example of how we're really trying to reduce our cultivations. But honestly, I'm really trying to find some ways of actually reducing cultivations further. And I think for all the ills of plastic, and let's face it, we use quite a lot of plastic in horticulture, uh, this is a particularly good use of it, I would argue, and actually maybe a way that we can really help to um, reduce cultivations. And I think we really need to uh, as a movement. Uh, and I know uh, Jake at Oxton Organics um, uh, was talking about that in their system. And I think that looked a really, really interesting system of trying to um, really reduce our reliance on cultivations. So in terms of understanding what's happening in the soils, and I'll, I'll sort of go on to the more the kind of uh, theory now. I've been taking soil organic matter measurements for, um, for 10 years or so. And so here we are, this is uh, probably December. I'm taking some soil organic matter samples in, in certain fields. Uh, basically, every part of the rotation, there's, there's kind of four different areas of the rotation on the main veg growing area. I'm also taking samples from polytunnels and, and some areas of orchard and some other bits and pieces. Um, essentially, creating a, a kind of W pattern across the field, taking about 20 sub samples, mixing them up in the bucket, down to about a foot, 30 centimeters. Uh, and then take your sample, which weighs roughly, um, it's only about 200 grams that you need to send off to the lab. So the idea obviously is to get a representative sample of what's going on. Important to note not to take samples just after you've cultivated. You wanna leave it at least several months. So ideally at the end of the growing season is quite a good time when your soils are kind of damp and fairly stable. Um, and then, yeah, send it off and understand what's going on in the soil. Uh, so that's been a really important process for me. And uh, one of the quotes I attributed uh, and put in the agroecology interview I did before, many years ago when I started growing, I did a very in-depth soil analysis. Um, and it, it looked at loads and loads of elements and uh, organic matter and some other bits and pieces. And to be quite honest, I found it really confusing and a bit conflicting. And it was quite expensive as well. Since, as I say, about 10, 11 years ago, I've actually just measured soil organic matter. I, I don't know whether I'm right or wrong, uh, but for me it's working because it's, it's, it's cheap, um, it's easy to understand, and to actually understand what your trends uh, are happening in the soil and kind of linking that to management practice is, I think, really, really important. And it just focuses your mind on the soil and really trying to build that soil organic matter, which hopefully then has proxy values to everything else that you're doing as well. So here's actually some results uh, from the farm. Uh, so yeah, going back to 2010. So the, the, the numbers here on the top, um, this is 
CO2 in tonnes per year for the whole farm. And this is measured on about uh, four acres there. So as you can see, a lot of variation going on, um, which is kind of interesting. I know the reasons for some of the, we've had some losses. I, I didn't, I know this particular one was a, a horrendous loss of um, soil carbon all in all. And I know I had a couple of failed crops cultivated too much and actually lost a load of carbon. So there's a big kind of learning curve there. Um, but the overall, if you look at the green line, the overall trend is going up. And actually the total amount of uh, organic matter that I'm sequestering on the farm is about 6.6 .6 tonnes of CO2 uh, per year, uh, which is quite a lot. So, you know, this is quite instructive to me. It does say there's a lot of variation. And I think it's also very, very important to look at long-term trends as well and to really understand what you're doing. But again, just having this data and, and keeping going with this. And I think, you know, if I extend this, say, another 10 years, I think that'd be fascinating. And I'm, I'm really trying to implement some changes now to reduce those cultivations and to increase the organic matter. And I, I want to see that line and I want to see that trend going up. I really want to see more organic matter uh, across the farm in the soils there, because this is really, really important. It's, it's about it's not just sequestering carbon, but it's uh, building fertility and improving the crops. So in terms of that process, I'll just lead you through it, um, of actually doing the soil sampling on your own farm. Uh, we, as Phil mentioned, I'm a director of the Farm Carbon Toolkit. And as part of that process, we've got a project called the Soil Carbon Project going on. We've developed some guidelines for testing um, soils for organic matter. And these are in conjunction with people like Rothamsted, Northwick, who've approved our kind of methods. And we found it was important to develop some soil organic matter testing protocols so that we you know, you know how to do it well and you know how to repeat it and to minimise those kind of sampling errors. So we've got that advice on our website and I'll put up a link in the chat later on where you can um, you can find that advice. So I'd recommend that as a starting point. When you've, um, sorry, just going back to that. So when you've done your W shape across the field, you've mixed your subsamples, you sent it off to the lab. And again, we recommend um, a couple of labs. In particular, you're looking for soil organic matter um, analysis uh, through loss on ignition. There's a debate whether you can use the DUMAS method as well. You can, uh, it's a lot more expensive, but we think loss on ignition to two decimal places, that's really important. And coming back from the lab, it will look something like this. So these are some of the samples from my farm, so it'll give you, you know, basically a spreadsheet of results. And the column on the right um, in yellow there, that's the really important bit. So each sample that you've, you've labeled, that is the organic matter percentage in your soil to two decimal places. So these are the kind of really important figures. Note that if you're going to understand the sequestration and the change, of course, you need at least two data points. So like at least last year and this year or five years ago and this year. Uh, the more data you've got, the better. So that's what you're looking for in the lab analysis. To convert that into carbon sequestered in your soil, uh, here's the farm carbon calculator and this particular section on um, soil organic matter. So you simply enter your data into this, this tool here. So I've done just an example one, um, field reference, the area in hectares, soil bulk density, that's very important. You need to understand that. You can get proxy values for soil bulk density, but I'd really recommend actually finding out what your own is. Uh, and again, you can get a lab to analyze that, or there's even a test that you can do yourself. The depth of the soil sample, so here's 30 centimeters a foot. Uh, and then you enter into the table here, all your historical soil and organic matter data. Um, so you can go back any number of years you like uh, and enter your data in, in terms of soil organic matter levels. And what it'll work out is an annual average sequestration rate. So as I said, the more data you've got, the better. So in this example, we've gone to the results of the carbon calculator here, and it, it's, it's worked out that that amount of uh, soil organic matter uh, in the long field, as I said, has sequestered 1.84 tonnes of CO2. That will then add into your sequestration total on the report. Uh, as we can see in this, this completely fictional example, um, soil organic matter is working out at about 17, 18% of your, um, your carbon sequestered on the farm, along with some hedgerows and woodland. Uh, and here it feeds into the total carbon balance of your farm. And you see the green bar there is actually an offset, a sequestration level 
Um, so here's your emissions from your farm, here's your sequestration, and this is the carbon balance of your farm. So it just shows the importance of understanding what's happening in terms of sequestration uh, for the carbon balance of your farm. What I'll do now is go through um, actual data from my farm from the last uh, soil organic matter, uh, sorry, the last carbon report that I did. So here's the head headline data, and I think this is a really exciting concept. Uh, my farm is net sequestering 19.24 tonnes of CO2 E per year, carbon dioxide equivalent. So effectively, every kilo, every pound, every tonne of produce that I'm producing is, if you're buying that, is taking uh, off your own carbon footprint. It's net sequestration. And that's a really exciting possibility. It basically means that farms can be part of the climate solution, not the problem. And soils are absolutely integral to that and often actually are the answers between a net a farm being a net emitter of carbon or a net sequester of carbon. So breaking down some detail there, um, in terms of the sequestration, you can see that soil organic matter is actually on this particular year is around 10% um, of my, my overall uh, sequestration. I've got some areas of woodland and some um, fast growing uh, um, something similar to willow and poplar, which is sequestering a lot of carbon here. Um, and over on the emissions, again, it gives you a breakdown. But maybe the most important figures here are, you know, the emissions are only about five tonnes of CO2 E per year, whereas the sequestration is minus 24 tonnes CO2 E per year. So there's a big, big difference there. Just to note, I said the farm's about four acres. That's about the, the growing area. I've also got some orchard and a bit of woodland, which bumps the whole area up up to about nine to 10 acres. So in terms of metrics, because um, one of the things was to, to talk about some metrics of, of what this means. Um, as I said, my overall carbon balance is minus 19 tonnes um, per year. We can divide that down per hectare. So we've got about minus 3.6 tonnes per hectare. So if I was comparing to another organic uh, horticulture unit, for example, we've got a bit of a metric to compare. Likewise, we have with tons of product. So minus six, six and a half tons of, pro, uh, of CO2 per ton of product. We can understand our fuel use. We can understand water use. And interestingly here, this is a new one we put in the calculator is carbon income. Now this is fictitious. And what I said is that if I was selling my carbon at 10 pounds a ton, I'd have an income of 192 pounds a year. Now, that doesn't sound great. Um, it's better than a kick in the teeth, certainly, but um, I think also we're going to see the carbon price go up, I hope, and if potentially we can be paid for sequestering carbon in our soils and our biomass, actually our incomes could be quite good. And if, if this figure were up to, say, £50 a tonne, then we'd be looking at an income of something approaching, you know, £1,000 a year. That's, you know, that's pretty worthwhile. And I think this is one to watch because there are companies desperately wanting to buy carbon offsets. It's a whole murky world. I could do a whole webinar just on that, but it's a reality and it's coming our way. And I think it's really, really important to try and understand your carbon footprint and what's going on. Um, and as I said, soils really can be the answer to that because they can turn you from a net carbon emitter to a net carbon sequester, just like that. And building soil organic matter, as we know, is a real win-win in terms of uh, not just sequestration, but soil health, biodiversity, productivity, and hopefully, you know, even the nutritional quality of crops as well. So I think that's probably all the detail from me. Um, there's a few resources there. If you want to use the farm carbon calculator, it's absolutely free to use um, for any farm and grower. It's really comprehensive. Hopefully it's easy to use uh, and you can understand your carbon footprint now. If you want to re read some more details on my farm and carbon footprint, go ahead to my website. And if you want to contact me, there's my email. Uh, obviously happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, J Jonathan. That's um, that's really great. I put um, um, I put your presentation, and also Dave's presentation, in into the into the chat box. So um, if if anyone missed those those links and wants to go back to them, they can um, they can have a look at that in in more detail. Um, and of course, it's all on the book. Will all be on the recording. So um, yeah, now we'll open it up to. Um, up to questions and um, 
I I think I'm probably going to start um, start with because we just had you, Jonathan. I just start with immediately with uh, with questions questions to to you. So uh, there's one question here, um, Jonathan. Would there be an advantage to growing the hedge barrier on the beach side to prevent the wind and sand blowing onto the crops? Yeah, absolutely. And actually, we are establishing some young hedges there. Um, there's a bit of hedge protection up the kind of west end of the farm, but not on the, the east so much. Um, actually, interesting kind of follow up to that is that um, we had some quite back in 2014, had some really severe storms in, in that February. And, and a lot of the, uh, the hedges very close to the beach there uh, were nearly completely lost to very high tide and, and storm surge. Um, so it was really a case of kind of, whoa, climate change in action. Um, was quite scary actually and I'm not quite sure what the long-term future of that land is and I've done a done a couple of articles on that so yeah severe links to um to a change of climate there but yeah it's a good point Karen. I guess you have to balance the um the, if that if that's in heading if that's south and southwest then you, that's where you most of your light comes from as well so your sunlight so you have to it is sure yeah and yeah, you, you sort of end up with fields getting a bit smaller, so it's uh, it's an interesting balance. Yeah. Um, okay. What else we have here? Um, has anyone thought about using biochar as a way of sequestering carbon and improving soil health? Jonathan, have you? Um, have you used I have actually done a little trial of biochar. Um, yeah, I'm really open to the idea. I think it's an interesting one. Um, obviously, it does matter where the biochar actually comes from. I think that's quite a big issue. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, as I say, I've given it a trial. I haven't got any conclusive results. Um, I could see it could work open to the idea and kind of just really interested in what it might be able to do. OK. Um, Dave, is biochar something you've, be, you've used at all? I experimented with it, Phil. Um, I, I didn't see any difference at all. So um, where I have uh, talked to somebody at university who had a suggestion, which was to incorporate it in composting. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was at Cornell. And they said that they had seen research that putting biochar into composting could end up with a, with a compost that was significantly higher in nitrogen at the end of the process. And in some way, it must stop it from outgassing during the nitrification. So I, I, we're experimenting with it, but uh, in terms of as a soil amendment to the soil, uh, I, I was not inspired by any impact at all that I could see. Okay. My hunch is that it will probably be quite long term the benefits if there are some. Yeah. Okay, um, we've got some more some more questions here, starting at the top of the one from Karen um, you, on the, the uh, USDA DA organic hydroponics and and, um, and are the nutrients fertilizers in the in the hydroponics uh, non non organic? Where does the nutrients come from in the uh, in those systems? So uh, allegedly they're not synthetic. So allegedly they're not oil based. Um, a lot of it is uh, through the process of hydrolysis. So they would typically have hydrolyzed soy protein. And um, by the time they're done with that, they, they can have something that can burn the roots off the plant. I mean, it's, it's a hot, you know, you can have a 1700 fertilizer from that. Um, but it was not created from oil. It is processed somewhere else and brought in um, they, they, there's a whole industry growing up around organic hydroponic. There are companies, a lot of companies that are now making uh, liquid feeds or wettable powders for providing the nutrition. Um, you know, when, it, when you tour a, a hydroponic place that's certified organic, you'll go in there, their compost pile is a locked cabinet with all these jugs of stuff. Um, that there, there's no biology involved on the farm, certainly, if it's a farm. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
So well, what next do we have? Um, yeah, from Antonia, Antonia Inson. Um, do we know, um, is it, I don't know whether this is one that you can answer, but do we know what is happening on organics in UK, in UK trade talks? Seems to me we need to keep equivalence with the EU organic standard to avoid the hydroponic and, uh, and, and capo issues. But I expect the US big organizations will, will be lobbying on this. Um, I can yeah. speak to that. I can speak to that. So the EU standards changed. Uh, the, the EU standards for organic were always that organic uh, must be based on soil. But um, some countries interpreted that a little differently. So there was some hydroponic growing in the three you know, Scandinavian countries um, that was being certified as organic. And in the latest uh, do-over of the organic EU organic standards, it was made clear that was not going to be allowed. So uh, amazingly, amazingly, the EU uh, Parliament said no, organic must be organic. And, and congratulations, because um, you know there's a huge hydroponic lobby in the EU too, of course. I know one group said that if you will allow hydroponic to be certified as organic, we'll have a thousand acres of glass greenhouse for you next year. And, um, mm -hmm. and the EU said no. So congratulations. And uh, I'll, I'll tie this to you know, Antonia's question and Jen's together. There's now going to be a trade discussion about whether right now there's equivalency between the US and the EU and uh, uh, United Kingdom. And basically, if we certify it as organic, you allow it. If you certify it, we allow it. We, we honor it on our shelves. And there's been a, a definite movement in, uh, in the EU to say, no, Canada does not allow something certified as hydroponic in the US to be exported to Canada as organic. So Canada said, no, we, we won't allow that. And the question is, will the EU say the same thing now or will you know, Great Britain say the same thing as a separate, as a separate entity at this point? So um, in that sense, the ball's in your court. Uh, and I hope that there's enough activism. Of course, there's gonna be huge, huge economic pressure. Bear in mind that the biggest, um, the biggest certified organic hydroponic operators in the world is Driscoll's Berries. And Driscoll's Berries is 70% of the American organic berry market and over 50% of the conventional market. So in, in organic, it's essentially a monopoly at this point. I'm assuming that Driscoll sells a lot of berries to the EU too. So um, you're going to have, you know, multi-billion dollar company coming saying, don't, don't, don't do this. And it's going to be hard to, to hold the ground on that. So you're going to have to be organized. It will be a fight. It won't be a debate. Um, and if, if you could do that, that would be really helpful for the American organic movement. Really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, I think it, it's interesting. I and mean, what you said about the, the Scandinavian countries, I mean, they were, I mean, they weren't, it, I mean, whether you really, really call it hydroponic, what they were grew, they weren't actually growing in soil, but they were growing in in demarcated beds, which meant that they were basically concrete greenhouses with with, with um, um, containers on top of the on, on top of the beds. So they were growing in a sort of um, in, in in a substrate. Um, so, but but they have, um, as you say, that's that's not being allowed anymore, and the and and um, we've had interest from. From, from Sweden as to as to kind of um, how they they transition from those systems to 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 systems whereby they're growing grow, growing in the soil and taking more more agro ecological approaches in terms of um, um, of, of, of pest pest control and disease control which all comes comes with that more integrated approach when you start growing properly in, into the into the soil so so that is in that in in that part way the EU is moving is moving in the right direction and the EU market is is moving in 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 that right direction in terms of the the the, the 
pressures politically to move move towards 25 percent organic by 2030. In the UK, it's a very different situation, and um, we have to hold on, be strong, and hold on to that um, um, to, to to that link to the EU st standards and not be consumed into in, into um, um, in, uh, under the pressures of uh, of bigger neighbours across the water. So, yeah, it's um it could it's something we have to certainly keep a, keep 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 an eye on, and um, um and it's something that's going to be potentially a very big situation in the future. Okay, so what other what else have we got? Keep the questions coming, people. So we've got um, Phil, can I ask Dave a question? Yeah, you can. Um Dave, in, in terms of this kind of certification situation, um is Real Organic Project a an independent certification body in the in the US or is it in addition to USDA? Yeah, Jonathan, it's in addition. We okay. we chose to be an add-on label. To be honest, at the first meeting, there were 30 farmers and uh, it was after this terrible meeting in Florida. And we said, what are we going to do? We're just going to go home and, and forget about it. Or are we going to take a stand? And it was unanimous. Everybody wanted to create another label. And so we said standalone or add on. And to my amazement, a majority said standalone. They, they were ready to step away from the USDA label. But that's really a, a lot of work. I mean, it would take a lot more money than we have to succeed at that um, at this point. So we are an add-on label and it's okay because the USDA does a great deal of good work in, in certification. Just some of the work they do isn't good. And, and I think that, that we are able to easily address that in terms of our inspections and our standards. So, uh, yeah, we're an add-on label. We were, yeah. and, and that isn't such a great deal for people who just refuse to get certified with the USDA. There are plenty of real organic farmers out there who are not certified organic. And uh, some of them are, uh, I respect very much. So, but, if, so if a grower just had the Real Organic Project logo, that's not legally organic then? Is that right? It, it, they they would not be certified by us if they weren't USDA certified as well. Okay, yeah. I, I never use the USDA logo on anything I sell, right? But but the store does care whether or not we're certain. They don't care if we're real organic certified. They care if we're USDA certified. Okay. So that gets us in the door, you know, on yep. the shelf. And then um, at this point, you know, the, the, a lot of farms are using it, but it, it doesn't have any economic impact for the farms yet at this point it's just a movement of people saying i believe in this this isn't right there's something else that's important I, I hope the day will get here i think it will soon where there's also an economic impact and someone will say i want to buy that because it's real organic project thanks well, certification isn't isn't a cheap, a cheap business to be to be in how do you how do you um what what's what do you charge your growers in addition to their normal certification to be yeah it's re it's really terrible phil we're free wow <laughs> so, that's brilliant so <laughs> how certain, do you manage that we go out and ask generous people if they will support this mm -hmm. and and so far they do um you know when i look at things like the organic program in denmark and i see this uh, amazing amount of uh institutional support from the government and I believe if that was an American economy for the amount of taxes per citizen, I think it's $10 per citizen, it would be $19 billion for organic. Okay, well, now we're really talking about a, having a different conversation, but we're not going to get the U.S. government to do that. However, that money all came from people. It came from the citizens. So if we can go to the citizens and say, will you support this? Will you give a little bit of money or for some people, maybe a lot of money to enable the organic movement to, to flourish and, and expand. And so far people have said yes. Good. Okay, we've got one outstanding, oh, two questions, more questions coming in, brilliant. But um, the Jim, Jim's question has been there for a bit and that is what are the risks of US government seeking weaker organic standards here in the UK as part of the trade deal? And what are the risks of our, our government agreeing? And that's probably more of an open question, <laughs> but uh, 
you can perhaps some. Um, you know, I'll let Jonathan answer, but I'll just say that I think that the um, the risks are very real. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've talked to people uh, in the EU, and they're like, "Please, please fix your problem," mm -hmm. because they're really afraid of uh, being pulled under by the inertia, the weight of this big, stupid American elephant that doesn't understand what it's doing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so it's a risk for us. Of course, we can start a new movement. We can or, or find a new name like agroecological. But honestly, I've been to a place that was 100% hydroponic, not a bit of soil in sight, not a bit of soil being used. And the grower described it as we really see ourselves as the embodiment of the principles of agroecology. It, it doesn't matter what they actually were a multi-million dollar marijuana producer. It doesn't matter um, what we name it. If, if we persuade people that it's something that they should support, the corporations will come in. It's what they do. There's not even any point in us getting angry about it. We just need to deal with it and not get lost in our depression um, and just say, you know, I, I, I like the idea of saying we need to cultivate biological literacy in our, in our customers and so that they're not just fooled by labels, but they, they start to ask the kind of questions that people are asking here, you know. Jonathan, did you have anything to say about the risks? Yeah, it's interesting, interesting, isn't it? I was sort of thinking about it from my own business perspective, and I sort of don't feel any risk at all, really, because, um, you know, I, I sell everything locally. It's within a few miles of where I live. And, um, uh, yeah, I think everyone buys it for what it is and where it's from and the quality of that produce. Um, but, yeah, certainly for the organic movement as a whole, clearly it feels pretty risky. And certainly, I mean, it's fundamentally, isn't it, when you, I think you're getting above the local food system scale, that becomes challenging. And when you're looking at supermarket shelves and what produce could be coming in there and there, you know, in that setting, you are reliant on the labeling, the certification behind it to understand what you're buying. And that feels like um, a huge risk. So, yeah, it does feel um, pretty challenging. But I sort of would also add that, um, yeah, ultimately it's incumbent on us in the organic movement also to probably push more local and, you know, the importance of local resilient food systems because it's fundamentally hand in hand with this issue, isn't it? And really understanding where your food's coming from and how it's produced. Um, and I think it's also an interesting one. There's, I know there's been debate years ago about, you know, whether it should have been called organic food or biological food like they do over in, in Europe generally. Uh, and that kind of connection to biological systems is probably a lot more helpful in helping to understand um how it's produced but anyway we are where we are with the, with the terminology let's not get into changing that in a hurry because that'll create a whole whole series of problems but yeah but i mean the biological aspects and the, and, and the biodiversity are you know are, are really important we have to communicate those uh, and there's a question here you know or a statement from antonio saying that maybe we need to talk about the total lack of biodiversity in in in, in hydroponic systems and uh and, and so on and that, and that you know and or you know it, to my mind maybe we need to emphasize the positives of our own systems rather than rather than the negatives of of others but certainly draw the draw the contrast um yeah to, i completely agree and actually um although i've banged on about carbon footprint i do think that's critically important i do always make the point there's not the be all and end all and actually there's a lot of other metrics including biodiversity water use you know even kind of you know landscape quality um nutrient density of food there's a whole load of metrics that to be honest we're only really getting to grips with and i think that's up to us as a movement to really start hammering on that and and pushing as you say the benefits of our own systems um because without that you know we will be sort of trampled over so uh, there's a lot of work to do still and and i feel that as a real positive as well this is actually what you know organic growing is all about isn't it it is about good food quality it is about soil it is about quality food nutrient dense food it, hopefully in local places to to feed people where they live um so you know it's up to us to get better at our own game i think as well yeah and it's interesting the nutrient nutrient density and that there's a lot of you know work now being going on and measuring nutrient density and uh, you know and maybe that's something that a tool that can be used to actually 
show the differences between you know re real organic crops and uh, and and crops grown grown in 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 hydroponics or or conventional systems. So I mean, there, there's a lot of variabilities in in nutrient density in terms of varieties and um, and variety choice and how, and other ways that things are grown as well. But it may be part of a tool that we can use. Just one thing to respond to Jonathan. I, I agree, of course, that we want to make the, the, our food system as local and as decentralized as we possibly can. But I also would say I go to the store and buy a lot of my food. And I live in a place where it's winter a third of the year. So, you know, a lot of it doesn't come locally. And um, I, I like chocolate and coffee, too. Mm -hmm. So uh, and, you know, it's very important. I was just talking with somebody who works with with the, the cocoa growers in Cameroon and Colombia. And it's so important what we're doing about whether they make a living. And, you know, they're really getting screwed by the conventional system. Really bad. He said it's like slavery. So, you know, what we want is to also step into like social justice as part of this conversation. And um, yeah, so. We've got a few other questions coming through. We need to need to respond to um, one from Huxley. It says maybe maybe a silly question. There's no such thing as silly questions. Um, but oh, disappeared. Where's it gone? Um, it's at the top. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. But um, how are, for example, um, are those non-soil organic berry farms different from non-organic non-soil ones? <laughs> Good. Well, in both cases, hydroponic is, is becoming rapidly moving to, towards becoming the norm. So Driscoll's is doing hydroponic for both its, you know, chemical conventional system and for its hydroponic. And the technology is almost the same. The, the only thing that's different is, you know, what kind of fertilizer do they put in the tank? Um, otherwise, it's pretty much the same. For berries, they're growing, all the hydroponic people are growing it on black plastic. The picture I showed is solid black plastic, but the more common model is uh, strips of black plastic with a pot set on them. And even the organic people, some of them were spraying the ground with glyphosate before they put the black plastic down, certified organic. And we, we the Real Organic Project, managed to get that stopped. And it's the only win that we've had in 20 years with the National Organic Program, but it was so egregious that when we came out with proof, they like, they changed it in days uh, and it, it, you know, they stopped it. But so that would be a difference is the use of herbicides. Um, for a lot of the, well, certainly for blueberries, insects are not such a big problem. So pesticides aren't the big deal. Weeds are the big deal for, for blueberries and, um, also with the hydroponic systems, in both cases, they get the crop a year earlier from planting. So they'll be picking blueberries by the third year and that makes them a lot of money. So I don't know, I hope I answered Huxley's question. Yeah, and I think perhaps the, you know, the, the issue really that people are gonna be com competing with is the, is the price if something is, is, in a, um, is in the supermarket, a planet of organic blueberries and it's going to be a lot, um, a lot cheaper than the, than the local grower is going to be able to, to, to put them out at with the, uh, with their their costs and so on. Um, okay, what other questions have we have we got here? Um, if something is GMO, it's not organic, is it, Dave? No. Uh, G GMO is not permitted in organic. So if it's certified organic and they're not lying, then it's not GMO. Yeah, and and then some questions. Um, yeah, about uh, uh, yeah. Do you from Emma? Do you disagree with hydroponics going forward as it isn't improving soil health and therefore sequest sequestering carbon? I I I believe that hydroponics is an inferior way of producing quality food, and uh, I also think that it is um, unhelpful positively a negative for climate. Um, but um, 
yeah, there is no soil. There can't be sequest sequestration. It's uh, what I wanted to say, Emma, is that I don't, it's going to be extraordinary if we could stop hydroponics. I don't think so. It's, it's massive and becoming more massive at, at velocity. So my goal would be to, pre to um, preserve a genuine alternative to that so that people can you know, make a choice, hopefully an informed choice, and, and you know, support the kind of agriculture that they want. And they're losing that choice right now. In America, you go in the store, you buy a blueberry, you have no idea. It doesn't even occur to you that it might be hydroponic. I was on a USDA task force when we discovered that Driscoll's was growing hydroponically. We didn't have any idea. We didn't even imagine that. Mm -hmm. And and I said, how, how many? Is it like a lot? She said, yeah, it's a lot. I said, 50 acres? She said, more. I said, 100? More. 500? More. 1,000 acres? More. I stopped asking. I was so stunned. So I know right now in California, they're certifying 5,000 acres of hydroponic production. That's one certifier, CCOF. So there's a lot of other certifiers in the world. Okay, question from Antonio. Um, there's a, a lot of research money in Scotland going into vertical farming, claiming that uh, that can leave the land to be rewilded. We need to balance this with research on organics. Yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting question. And um, I think it picks up on an important point, isn't it? I think uh, what you're seeing is a lot of the particularly uh, chemical companies take, making the argue for sustainable intensification. Sounds great, doesn't it? We can produce all our food on a small amount of land and leave the rest of, of it to be rewilded. And I think that notion um, is fundamentally wrong. I think those of us who are in organic farming growing would argue that actually you can increase biodiversity on the land that we've got and produce food at the same time. Um, and I just think it is, it speaks to the model of um, intensive farming and centralized um, food production systems that are fundamentally um, not the way that we should be going, whilst you know, clearly leaving more land to be rewilded arguably is, uh, is important, especially in a country like the UK that's very kind of um, denatured, I'd argue. Um, yeah, that does not feel the right way forward for me at all. Yeah, I think um, that is, is I think that is a big issue here with them. Um, you know, there was a couple of years ago, there was a, um, um, and the BBC Food and Farming Awards uh, gave an award to the, um, um, to, to I think, under, underground farming company, I can't remember what they were called, but um, basically they were growing, gr growing salads in um, underground tunnels in, um, in, in, in London. And that was kind of, the future, the future, future of farming, which uh, you know is kind of a, a inter interesting take on it. But there's a lot of pressure on that sort of, you know, that so-called local food because it's produced in in, in uh, exactly where where in the urban areas and it's not using land and and uh, but that is worrying. Yeah, it's like having the food manufactured locally. Mm. Um, I I don't. I have yet to see that the vertical farms are, are even cost efficient, never mind uh, resource efficient. Um, they, they so far have basically survived off the funding of mega billionaires. And um, everyone's very excited about a, such a high tech way of, of manufacturing food. But um, I don't think that they've proven economically yet in any case. I think they only survive off of a kind of Ponzi scheme of let's get more investors and more investors. And, you know, they put out the word and they get $500 million in investment in a weekend. Um, it's very attractive to control everything, but uh, I, don't, I don't think it works very well. I don't think the food is good food. Um, I think it's insanely crazy from an energy perspective. It's like, everything and, and i'm a greenhouse grower in a cold climate so i use more energy than i want to but it's so energy intensive to do that vertical thing so you're rewilding the land to try and offset all the energy used in making the salad greens uh mm -hmm. it just seems crazy yeah um there's a um, question on biodynamics um could this could this be helpful and uh um i mean that's 
Yes. <laughs> yes, it, there is a place for both of Yeah. It's great. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and and it, and and yeah, it's it's an ex, it's another it's another form. It's a certification of of organic, and it's one in which is very much part of the the whole yeah. system. The whole the whole the whole farm system is 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 an organism, and that is not one that would be compatible with uh, with these types of systems. Um, the biodynamic farms I've seen have been exceptional. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Another some um, there's more there's statement i think here scale is a big issue eggs in one basket diversity is always the thing that is most resilient yeah um my hope is that when artificial fertilizers become prohibitively expensive with carbon taxing that biochar will come onto its own restoring marginal soils it's exponentially more effective in improving degraded soils than than already healthy soils So one of the people who's, who's um, part of the Real Organic Project is a man named Fred Kirshenman, and he's a longtime organic farmer in the US. And he's always saying the same thing as Anonymous here, which is um, that the whole world is about to change in terms of the economics of, of oil. And when that change happens, the kind of farming that you know organic, real organic does is going to become much more economically viable. And I, I think that is possibly true, although I can imagine the opposite also coming true, which is that things are going to get very rough and we won't like the new governments very much. So uh, all I can say is we shouldn't wait for that. It might be true, but we shouldn't wait. We, you know, we, we need to be building the island of sanity now. Great. I mean, I think that sounds. I mean, we're we're coming towards the end. We've. I think we've. Um, um, we have that answered. Um, Antonia's question. I think so. Um, we. I. I think. Um, yeah. I want to say thank you very much to to our, our panelists, but also um, I want to just just before we go introduce our our next um, next webinar in the series, um, which will be on the twenty fifth Wednesday, twenty fifth of August. Uh, same same time, same place. Um, that will also be one that's run by the OGA, and um, that that one is exploring um, growing. It's called growing staples. It's um, um, exploring field scale production, and how can we grow grow the basic crops efficiently yet regeneratively? We've seen um, a growing kind of renaissance in kind of small scale um, small scale market garden type growing which is brilliant but what where we seem to be missing is is um is is new entrants and new and people with skills coming into the and growing the um and growing the staple crops and uh, are also needed for for, lo for local for local markets and for local local production so we'll be we'll be drawing on some some um really experienced growers like he like Ian Torres of Forest Organics um Adam York of um Cleveland's Market Garden in um in, near Cardigan in Wales, um, and also Re Rita Oldenburg of Cleve Farm in, in Somerset, who is um, not such an experienced grower, but one who has who has made that transition from from kind of small scale to growing um, to, to to using tractors and growing growing the field scale crops. So I think that's going to be um, a fascinating session. I'll send the link through on when when we send the recording through um, sort of after the after the events closed. Um, but I do in, in, encourage you to, um, to, to book, book on that and hope, um, hope we'll see some of you at, the, at, at that event as well. Um, so, yeah, um, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you've all enjoyed the um, um, attending the web webinar. I know it's been fascinating listening to, listening to Dave um, and, and to Jonathan. And we just um, have to keep those, uh, keep, Keep flying the flag for, for for real real organic over here as well as in the US. So, yeah, thank you and um, good night. Thank you all. Uh, yes, you have one last thing. Thank you. If if people go to realorganicproject.org, if you're interested, the symposium that we did in January, it's all still there, and it's really really engaging and gripping. There were five sessions, and they're great. So check it out. 
Thank you, Dave.